I'm very thankful for uh, for the help of the folks that I have standing up here. Um, just to give you a quick background, this actually started off with about a half a dozen of the field assistant ales last year in Denver um, as a as a talk to say Let, let's let's put together a field trip. Let's get crazy and put together an accessible field trip, and and we did. Um, Tony and I had a really good conversation about about that last year. Brett and I took over and. And then uh, we brought Allison on. Um, each each of us are going to talk specifics, um, so I will go ahead and get started on the the logistics of this. So we wanted to put together a field course or a field trip uh, that was completely accessible for students with with all kinds of diverse abilities. This is something that that, that Brett and I tried to do about three years ago when GSA was in Minneapolis um, and had not much success with that. We had one person sign up? Yeah, one. Yeah. Um, so, and it, it didn't work out well. We, we, we didn't know what we were doing, honestly. Um, and we still really don't. <laughs> <laughs> but, so what we did, um, we developed the idea, and then, um, and, and, and we'll talk about the, the whole funding and everything else as, as we get into it, but um, once we realized this was actually going to happen, we started putting out a call for participation. We were essentially looking for 15 current geoscience faculty or geoscience instructors to go along with 15 students with diverse physical or cognitive abilities to team up with those faculty. And we were even going so far as to include high school and middle school students in that which became a nightmare with IRB that I'm not going to really get into. But, um, nonetheless, the student population that we had were all college-age students. Um, along with the logistical planning for this, and this is something that's going to come out of this, uh, this whole project, is, is um, what can we take away from this? And, and we're going to talk about ways in which what we did in terms of planning and the findings that we actually um, received will benefit the community in terms of providing accessible courses or accessible opportunities in the future. Uh, the idea is to communicate. Communicate early, communicate often. Once we identified our participants, we started to establish a community. Um, and I tend to be uh, overzealous with communication and email, which actually is what needs to happen. You need to find out what your participants need. You need to find out what they can do. And, and, and you need to make sure that they're comfortable. Um, so we, in doing that, in, in all of our communication, we conducted a, an informational assessment of not only their needs, but their abilities, uh, their background, their experience, those kinds of things. Um, and as a result, we started to identify potential barriers to running this field course. And, and in identifying those potential barriers, which if any of you have, have been a part of our uh, instructional accommodation workshop. You identify the barriers first, and then and then start to determine specific accommodations for those barriers, which which we did as a result of a scouting trip. I was up here about three weeks ago with Brett. We hit a lot of the field sites that we were going to use, and we actually got rid of a few of them um, because they weren't going to work. So it's probably best to do that when you don't have 35 people tagging along with you. <laughs> so we came up. Uh, and did that, and then had a couple of beers and talked about what we were freaking out about with the time, which was IRB issues. But, um, so then we, uh, we, we aligned some, uh, some accessible transportation because knowing what our students needed, our participants needed, we needed some accessible uh, vehicles, which we did. Long story with that one too, but we'll leave it at that. Uh, some, and then food, allergies, I mean these are, these are common uh, issues that that it, regardless of, of accessibility, physical accessibility, that you're going to have to, to, uh, to, to take care of. And then finally, the instructional resources and interpretation needs of the students. So we had, um, and, I'll, and I'll get into in a minute, the, based on the demographics of our population, we had to have both an interpreter and, uh, and modified instructional resources that would, that would accommodate their needs so that everybody was able to participate. Here's our group, 15 students plus one, because on the morning of the trip, we actually had a student that showed up late and missed her field trip and asked if she could come with us. I said, come on. 
the best the best highlight that I have here is that eight of our 15 students were on to the future students. This was their first time attending GSA. On to the future actually paid their registration, gave them uh, membership to GSA, and uh, we worked very well with Talia Bear on this too. Um, we, we took care of all their travel and GSA took care of all their registration. It was a, a great partnership. I was really excited about, about this eight. Uh, we had 14 geoscience faculty. Um, unfortunately, one of them was double booked on Saturday, so she could not come with us on the field trip. However, she did participate um, in the uh, other activities that, that Tony and Allison are going to talk about. We had four instructors, clearly. Uh, we, I did bring an undergraduate student from the University of Cincinnati with me who is, a train, uh, who is trained in American Sign Language. The main issue that we had with this was that the student that we had on the, on the trip did not know American Sign Language. So let me quickly talk about flexibility as a big, <laughs> <laughs> as a big issue. Uh, so we had to figure that out and, and we had about a week to figure that out because all along we thought this student was uh, just needed uh, ASL interpretation and then quickly found out that that did not happen and GSA and Nancy, Nancy Wright at GSA was a, a godsend in terms of helping us figure that out not only for our trip but then he needed the accommodations to attend uh, the meeting as well. He actually gave a presentation and uh, took and fielded questions and everything so uh, it was a very very big success for both us and for, for GSA. So we had a, a support team member from the American Geosciences Institute who joined us to, to uh, kind of capture the, the to, to, to document the experience, and then uh, the GSA TV joined us as well. Seventeen, so we have thirty-five total, uh, not counting our addition. Actually, counting our addition because one couldn't go and one ended up joining us. So we did, we saw thirty-five total. Seventeen of them self-identified with a uh, f diverse physical or cognitive disability. Here's our group. This was uh, the last stop. Everybody's smiling because we are about to head home. <laughs> um, right at the Chief. This was in Stowamas. So this is our group. I'm going to turn it over here quickly to Brett, and he'll continue on. So we each get to go over by the same amount that one person normally goes over, right? Yeah. 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 Four or four minutes over. That's good. The last talk. That's good. <laughs> the first thing I wanted to show you is the, we, for those of you who are on the trip, uh, if you were on the trip, can you just get a, raise your hand quickly? Excellent, we got a lot of people here, that's good. Um, we did in fact have a regional map. This somehow did not make it into the field guide, but I wanted to just show that it did in fact exist. So this is a trip we do quite frequently in this area, and I've done this many, many times myself, almost 30 times. We go from the Vancouver region and we go almost to Whistler. We don't quite make it to Whistler, usually. But the geology in this area is really amazing, and there, there really are a lot of different stops that we could do. So we generally run this, I, I do this most often now as a natural disasters trip, but I've also done it as an introductory geology trip. And I think there's probably 30 or 40 places I could stop in this area. So this is help in that I know the area and I know the places that are going to be good or bad. Unfortunately, it also means that, you know, that not all of those are going to work out. So access has been a, was a problem all the way along. And this maybe gives you a good idea of the, some of the access problems <laughs> that you might have. This, this is how we felt sometimes when we were hitting these, these locations. So, so this is a, actually a landslide just right near one of the stops that we were at, uh, near Porto Cove. So when we were doing this, though, we had to go to these locations and stop and think to ourselves, you know, what's going to work and what's not going to work. So this is a picture from when Chris and I were scouting. And you'll notice that Vancouver being Vancouver, it was an absolutely spectacular day without a cloud in the sky. But we'd stop at these locations and we'd start to think to ourselves, what are the barriers? We're going to have a wide a wide array of abilities in this trip. It's gonna, some of these stops are going to work for some people, some of them aren't, and, and we're going to have to do what we can with accommodation in each of these places. So we looked for a lot of places, first of all, that would be able to access, to, to have the, the bus, the accessible bus with the lift. And that was kind of a key thing. We needed to have a pretty good parking lot to, to do these things. So what I want you to do is think about how this is going to be a problem if you were going to do it. So I want you to take just a second, think to yourself. If you had a stop like this, what we have is a beach, you can see some stairs in there. What, what do you think some of the barriers might be for the students that you might have to accommodate? Stop and just turn to your neighbor or someone nearby you and think about what you would do if you had to take a group to this location. Go ahead, right now. Yeah. 
Okay, everybody. So does someone want to give me one thing that they see that might be a problem? Stairs. Stairs. Yeah, so there's a bunch of stairs right there in the front. Certainly an issue. Coming from a guy who was there. Yeah. <laughs> Sand. Also a big issue if you're going to have chairs. Okay. So that's some mobility issues. Anything else we might see? How's, what's the water going to do? Yeah, blind and fall in the water. We actually had a cliff you could fall over here, too. Yeah, okay. Other things? Bikers is a definitely a big problem, and this is spoken from someone who knows he was walking on the seawall, and the cyclists do not like it when you stand on the cycle lane. You get dinged by the little bike bells very aggressively. Um, another issue, you can probably just make out the furthest right figure is actually the guide dog, who's enjoying herself immensely. She's, she's being a pet at this point, and there's no dogs allowed in the park. Uh, guide dogs are allowed, however. Okay, so th this is an interesting thing. I mean, you could start to see some of the issues that we started to have. This is actually one of our first stops, and it is one that we used, and that we were quite happy about using for a few reasons. So if you look down on this, this is Third Beach. You can see we've got a nice big parking lot. You can see a structure in the middle, and then uh, the stairs are right near where that marker is. Um, in looking at this, when we actually go there, we have lots of issues. The two things on the top and the bottom are really steep ramps. We were excited there were ramps, we were a little less excited that they had a sign up that said no wheelchairs. <laughs> Very helpful. Very. I'm glad they built those ramps. That was a big deal. Then we had stairs, two sets of stairs, one that goes down to the seawall, one down to the beach. We had the beach itself. We had a lot of traffic along the seawall. And I knew this was going to be an issue down on the far side. There's an outcrop, and when you take a bunch of geologists to an area, they all start walking towards the outcrops as they can. Then we knew that not everyone was going to make it down the stairs. So what we had to do with this location is we stand at the, st at the top, and say, okay, we're at a crossroads here. Some people are going to go some places, some people are going to go other. We want to try and make sure that everyone has a good trip. So we were lucky with this location where that first circle is of the stairs. There's actually a viewing platform that has glass walls. And so the people who were less mobile could stay up there and look down. And what we had people do is bring back samples, both from the outcrop and from the beach. And the questions we had were having people observe. Generally, we had groups of two. We had an experienced person with a less experienced person, and we asked the more experienced person to sort of advocate for them. So having done all that for all the stops, we did a lot of stuff pre-trip. Pre we, uh, one of the students that Chris has made tactile maps for the, the low vision people so that they could actually touch and hold the, uh, the maps. This is not just a hit with the people with low vision. Everybody wanted to touch these maps. So uh, they used two versions. There was one with puffy paint, so there were ridges over the, over the boundaries, and you could sense. And the other one was different types of sandpaper, denoting different types of material. Um, we started to prep a virtual field guide, but time being what it is, it didn't quite work out. So that's something we're going to look forward to doing in the future. Um, we changed the handout in the way we would normally run this trip. We wanted people to have just a little more information about what to expect, so there was a little less uncertainty. And uh, Chris then used his beautiful voice to create an audio guide with chapters that represented each one of the stops, talking about all the information that we had. When we were on the trip, as I mentioned before, we sort of asked everyone to be open-minded and be aware that there was a lot of diverse abilities that we all wanted to help each other. So we asked them to self-advocate if they were having trouble, and we asked them to advocate for others if they saw that there were going to be issues. And so we had several situations where multiple people were bringing back samples, for example. Uh, people were describing what was happening to those who couldn't see. Uh, we stayed very flexible. We actually got completely off our schedule at the very first stop because people were having a good time and they were exploring and that's really what we wanted and because frankly I thought the next stop was going to be in a cloud. So <laughs> it wasn't. We lucked out for weather. Uh, and then like I said, we asked everyone to really share their experiences. And so, you know, you might ask, how did it go? I mean, it went really wonderfully. We have a few shots here. We have a picture of using her cane there. She's low vision and is in her chair. and just got yelled at by a biker because they are standing on the bike lane of the seawall. But this is at the outcrop I was showing that was inaccessible. Some people got over there. And you can see some people are, you know, even, even within mobility issues, they're more and less inclined to go places. It was quite fearless in a lot of ways. Um, here we have a group of people near the barrier in Garibaldi Park. We're up in the parking lot and people have brought back a whole bunch of samples for those who couldn't get down to the very rocky uh, floodplain. Uh, we're looking at a variety of andesites here from a, a mega landslide and an ice contact volcanism event. So the whole crowd is crowded around checking out these rocks. Uh, this is again down on the floodplain. We have uh, who are uh, who are uh, both 
vision impaired down I mean the really rocky flood point with their partners checking out how things are going and how everything feels and sounds um, and then this is one shot that Chris wanted in here particularly this is our uh, our hearing impaired student and his interpreter so because he didn't know American Sign Language what she did is she used a phone or a tablet or a computer and she just wrote down everything that was said However, because she knew American Sign Language, she could do it in a, in a shorthand way that was easier for her to understand. Tell about what you're talking about first, tell about why, and then you get into the details of it. He, he was very happy with, with this event, so you can see. She also said that just if people were talking near her, she would just write that down as well. So he could be part of the group and part of the conversation. Uh, and then we have two people here touching glacial striations on a rock near the Suwamish Chief. Um, and so we have one person who has some mobility issues actually helping feel where those striations are. And they're discussing what that means and the implications for the uh, ice flow in that area. So I think that's the last one for me. And I'm going to pass it over to Tony here. OK. And I'll go over here then, shall I? Yeah, sure. Just stand right there. <laughs> Thank you. Just look beautiful. All right. So uh, my role and Allison's role in this project is that of the independent researcher. We conducted pre- and post-trip interviews with our faculty and our student participants. I'm going to talk about the faculty people that I talked with. And you'll hear about the students in a minute from Allison. Uh, we also did direct participant observation uh, during the field trip. And this image tells me, uh, helps me tell the story about a couple of things that emerged in terms of the, the data that came out of the conversations with, with the faculty and our observations. Uh, this is the outcrop at the last stop where we were looking at, at uh, glacially striated granite. That's not one of our uh, research participants. That's a pr another person who came along. But this is a a slope with some boulders here. It's fairly stable, but it's wet. Um, and during, at, at this point, one of our uh, visually impaired students scrambled up and over that slope, up the grassy slope, to get a feel at that rock to have a tactile experience with it. Now, having said that, every risk assessment officer in North America has just now had a heart attack. <laughs> And we'll send them a card later. But um, what I learned from the preparation and the uh, getting this, uh, getting the background for this this trip going is that uh, the uh, perception of risk in the university bureaucracy is heightened dramatically, and that shouldn't surprise anybody. But one of the things I want to work on is uh, how to mitigate that um, in preparing for one of these trips. And the um, other thing I want to talk about is um, the partnership between faculty and campus offices that serve disabled students, whether it's disability student services or student disabled services. The partnership is very limited, and usually the interaction consists of, here's my form for time and a half on the exam. The partnership is uh, on a continuum from being tense to being a warm partnership. But the key thing here is that the two partners, faculty and uh, student disabled services, they partner to negotiate and navigate the regulatory landscape and the legal landscape. They are not partners in the educational landscape. And among our participants, everybody wanted to see that change. So we are going to be working on uh, strategies and ideas for um, for uh, enhancing those relationships. That's two preliminary findings that have come out so far, given that these data are five days old now. Yeah. So, all right. Now I'm going to turn it over to Allison so she can talk about the students. Okay. But yeah, I'm Allison, and I had the absolute pleasure of um, speaking to the students both before, during, and after our field experience. So what I'm going to share with you really are some very preliminary findings, and we have a lot of very, very rich and really superb data that Tony and I will be working through over the next few months. So we're going to go into this much more deeply, but I'm just going to give you kind of a taster, if you like, of some of the things that, that we found out about, about our students, about their prior experiences, their expectations and their hopes for the day, and a little bit about their experiences and how, how they're prepared to now be advocates for what IAGD are trying to achieve. So in terms of prior experiences, I don't think, it, it wouldn't be fair to say that it was universally negative. I think there were a lot of our students who had really good field experiences, 
but there was clearly an element of negativity in there, which meant that there was a degree of um, feeling a little bit daunted by field work, that feeling that you're always the weakest link, you're the one at the back, you're the one that everybody has to wait for. There's an element of being misunderstood, both in terms of what you do need and what, maybe what you don't need when you're taken out on field work. And also this feeling of being unsupported, and that ties in very much with what Tony was saying. It's unsupported in terms of faculty support on the field trip, in terms of support from your peers, but also support from within your university, from asking the students whether they were actually provided with support when they'd done field work previously. Very, very few of them indicated that they had any help in terms of participating in field work, which I think is very sad. In terms of their expectations and hopes for the day, this was really interesting. So of course they were expecting that we would consider the physical aspects of the disability, but there was also an expectation that there would be a different attitude, okay? there would be a different mentality within the people that were leading the field trip and the people that were participating within the field trip. That would extend to there being multiple means of engagement, you know, the recognition that different people would need to engage in very different ways. We've just seen the photograph of our hard of hearing student um, and the way that he was engaging with, with his helper, the way they engaged our, our visually impaired students. Everybody was engaging with that field work in a completely different way. And it was inclusive socially. Everybody had a part to play. And it really did feel like everybody was on an equal playing field. In terms of experiences and opinions, um, one of the big messages that came across is that the pressure was off for our students. Previously, when they'd been out on field, but they did feel under pressure, you know, to, to keep up with everybody else, to not slack behind, to not be perceived as being lazy or not keeping up. And I think this feeling of the pressure being off, it wasn't immediate for everybody, but I think certainly as we got through the morning, there was a general feeling that, yeah, we're being, we're being looked after here. These people know what they're doing, um, and they're making sure that our needs have been, been properly catered for. So everybody was included. The pace of the field trip, people were telling us, yes, it was, it was right. You weren't hurrying us at these locations. There was opportunity for discovery, so everybody had time to go off and find out things at their own pace and in their own way. And social interaction, as I say, was a very big part. Um, in the post-field trip interviews that I've done, I've kind of rounded off the interview by asking people, you know, in 10 years' time, when you think back on this, what's the big memory that you'll have of this day? And of course people will remember where they were and what they did, but the big overriding memory is who they were with. It's those people, the other people, that made that experience. And I think that's a very powerful thing. And that's something that obviously had been lacking from previous field experiences, certainly in a positive way. And I think one of the best outcomes from this is that what we are cultivating, community of advocates for the IAGD, pretty much without exception, all the students that I've spoken to have said that they are prepared to now go away to their departments and talk about what the IAGD is trying to achieve and trying to work with their departments to promote accessible field work. Of course they'd like resources from us. Um, and some of the um, suggestions are maybe a case study of what we've done for the day that's going to demonstrate that this can be done, some guidelines, take to faculty to say, these are the changes you need to make. It's not necessarily difficult, and you can make these changes. But I think the big thing that's coming out of this is that we now have this community. And when our next field, uh, accessible field trip is planned, I know that there is a core of people who are just going to be absolutely itching to get involved and to, to run that next field trip. Okay, so that's what I found out. <laughs> All right, thank you, Alison. Let me wrap this up real quick. Um, so moving forward from this, we now have a realization that there is, so another, another big finding was that a lot of people expected really, really rigorous field work to get in, get dirty, but we're also finding that there's a spectrum of rigor and along that spectrum, it means that, that the more rigorous that the field work is does not necessarily mean that there's more learning taking place. And quite often, especially with this participation, the more rigor means the less learning. Because they're more focused on their interaction and ability to move around freely within the environment than they are focused on learning and understanding the content. We would like to thank the organizations that provided financial support for this work, including the National Science Foundation and the Society of of exploration geophysicists. If you're interested in this work 
and other accessibility issues in geosciences, please join the International Association for Geoscience Diversity. Membership is free, and more information is provided at viagd.org. Thank you.